All right, well, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, take our Bibles, if we could, and open them to the book of Genesis, chapter 11 and verse 6. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6. And if you're here with small children, um, our exhortation to you is to try to catch the service um, in overflow. And we also have a fantastic nursery. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6. The title of our message this morning is Blessed Obstacles. Blessed Obstacles. Probably one of the worst things that God can do to somebody is to give them exactly what they want. Here in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6, you know, we see a bunch of people wanting something very badly. And yet God disrupted their project and did not give them what they wanted. I think there's a country western song. I'm not going to sing it for you. I think it goes something like, thank God for unanswered prayers or something like that. Maybe someone can come up here and sing it for me today. By the way, I grew up in the uh, day of what they called backward masking. Do you guys ever hear of that? Or if you play records backwards, it would give a satanic message. So I tried uh, playing a country western song backwards, and I got my truck back, and I got my wife back. (laughs) Got my dog back. (laughs) So we're continuing on here with our, I don't know how I transitioned from there to this. We're continuing on here with our verse-by-verse study through the book of Genesis, and the first part of the book features four events. Number one, creation, chapters one and two. We get a clear description of what the world was like before sin entered the picture. Number two is the fall, what went wrong, chapters three through five. And I love the way the Bible is set up. It doesn't just dwell on the problem. God moves very fast into the solution. And you don't have to get far into the Bible to see the solution. The solution is a coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. You see that as early as Genesis 3 verse 15 And the rest of the Bible, the book of Genesis included, is unpacking that promise. In fact, the book of Genesis largely is going to trace that promise, as does the bulk of the Old Testament for that matter. And then we move to our fourth major event, which is the flood, studied that, chapters 6 through 9. And then the fourth event. Flood three, fourth event is national dispersion, chapters 10 and 11. That's the section we find ourselves in today. That's the section we've been giving ourselves to the last few Sundays and we'll continue to do so. The section begins with the table of nations. Genesis 10 is a record of where Noah's descendants settled after the flood. Descendants of Ham, descendants of Shem, descendants of Japheth. Because from these three and their respective wives, the earth was repopulated after the flood. But at the same time, it leaves us with a lot of unanswered questions. Where did these nations come from? Why are they dispersed? Uh, What does it mean when it says in the days of Peleg, Genesis 10, verse 25, the earth was divided? 
How did Nimrod, the builder of an empire in Mesopotamia, get pushed up north into Assyria? And we have all of these questions when we leave Genesis 10, and fortunately we have an answer in Genesis 11. The Tower of Babel story is the answer to those questions. Genesis 11 verses 1 through 9 is the cause. Genesis 10 is the results. So it's sort of tricky. We kind of expect Genesis 10 and Genesis 11 to be in exact order, and they're not. We believe Genesis 11 occurred first, and the results are recorded in Genesis 10. But we've seen, as we look at an outline of the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, the former world, verses 1 and 2. What was the world like exactly before God confounded the language? You see verses 3 and 4, the rebellion, how humanity did exactly the opposite of what God said. God said, spread out, and they said, no, after the flood, we're going to come together and build a tower to make a name for ourselves. And then we saw last time, verse 5, God's condescension. God actually has to come down to see what these people are doing. God kind of takes a look at their little sandcastle that they were so proud of. More on that a little bit later. But we come today to verse 6. And verse 6 is God's observations. When God comes down to see what the builders were constructing, he makes here three observations. One was their universality. Number two was their beginning. And number three was their potential. And God comments on all three. And we pick it up here with Genesis chapter 11 and verse 6. And it says, The Lord said, Behold, they are one people and they have the same language. And this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. The first uh, observation that God makes at this project, which was in rebellion against him, is he observes the fact that they are universal. They are connected. The reason that they are connected or bound together is they have, it says it right there in verse 6, uh, one language, and they were of one nation. And that in and of itself is going to create two problems. The first problem is described in verse 6b, and the second problem is described in verse 6c. The first problem with having only one language and one nation over the face of the earth is the fact that it is the beginning of a major problem. When you look very carefully at verse 6, it says, and this is what they began to do. In other words, more steps of rebellion are going to quickly follow this one. This step here that they're taking, this collective rebellion against me, is just the beginning of the problem. Arnold Fruchtenbaum in his Genesis commentary says this, the first problem was, this is what they begin to do. Meaning this is only the first act of rebellion in this one place. If left to themselves, more acts will follow in this one place. So we're going to see here that God does not give these people what they wanted because this is just the beginning of rebellion. And the rebellion that's taking place here is going to be replicated. And so God takes active steps to put an obstacle or a hindrance on these people. And the second observation that God makes, actually the third one, their universality one language, their beginning is number two. And their third one, I think, is the most important, is their potential. 
Here it's not speaking of their potential for good. It's speaking of their potential for wickedness. You'll notice there at the end of verse 6, it says, Now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. A lot of people read that and they say, well, this is talking about their potential to do good. And that's not what your Bible teaches. This is not speaking of their potential for good. This is speaking of their potential for wickedness. If only one government exists on planet Earth and that government falls into the hands or falls into the wrong hands, then man's potential for wickedness is unprecedented. Why does God say this? He says this because he understands human nature. Modern psychology, humanism may not understand human nature, but God understands it very well. He understands what people are capable of if there's no restraint on their sin nature. After all, it was God in Genesis 8, verse 21, right after the flood, God made the statement that the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 17 and verse 9, makes a tremendous statement concerning man's potential for evil. Jeremiah says the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? That is the assessment of God as he looks at fallen humanity. We are by nature sick because of a sin nature that we have inherited from Adam. A lot of people have this idea that, well, my sin makes me a sinner, and that's not true. You were a sinner before you committed a single sin, as was I. I am not a sinner because I sin. Rather, I sin because I'm already a what? A sinner. I'm just fulfilling my job description. It's interesting that when you have small children, and don't get too hard on your small children, because we were the same way when we were their age, Our parents never had to sit us down and say, okay, we're going to give you a lesson today on self-centeredness. Here is how you throw a tantrum. Ready? Here's how you do it, because we've got to teach you how to do it. My parents never had to teach me how to hoard my toys. Rather, they had to teach me the exact opposite. They had to teach me how to share with other people, because I didn't want to share. I still don't want to share to a very large extent. (laughs) They had to teach me how to control my emotions because my emotions were out of control. And I'm convinced that most kids today, if they were, could act out what they want to do, would probably qualify as serial killers. And the only thing that is the, oh my goodness, I'm glad that serial killing didn't happen, is you're a little bit bigger than they are and a little bit stronger than they are. And so the goal of parenting is always to take kids and to teach them to go counter to their sin nature. Because the sin nature is natural to all of us. That's what the book of Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says. Jesus spoke of this in Mark 7. Verses 20 through 23, it says that, Jesus speaking, that which proceeds out of the man is that which defiles the man. From within, that's our sin nature, that's our hearts at work. For from within, from the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, Deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit and sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evils proceed from within and defile the man. We can't be like uh, Flip Wilson, who says the devil made me do it. We're like this in our natural sin nature without Satan's influence on us at all. Of course, Satan takes advantage of our sin nature. 
he knows where we're weak and he puts temptations in front of us. But the truth of the matter is all of us are like this inherently, innately, because of a nature that we have inherited, which is hostile to God. Now, I hope you believe that this is true, because if you don't believe this is true, you won't see your need for Jesus Christ. You won't see your need for an internal transformation through the spiritual birth that only God can provide. The whole message of being born spiritually, having your sins cleansed, and having Jesus via the Holy Spirit living inside of us, that whole message will make no sense to you when we don't accept what the Bible teaches concerning the reality of the sin nature. And if you believe this, it forms in a nanosecond your very political philosophy. Why is that? Because Lord Acton said something. He said this, all power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts what? Absolutely. And this is why God, in Genesis 11, beginning in verse 6, confounds the language so that the builders at the Tower of Babel could not cooperate with each other because essentially what they were building is a one-world government, a new world order. Now, a one-world government works fine if the person orchestrating it doesn't have a sin nature. Of course, that's what Jesus Christ will orchestrate one day in the thousand year reign of Christ. That's the only new world order I want to be part of because he will be unrestrained by a sin nature. But before that time in history comes, if there's only one government on the face of the earth and that government falls into the wrong hands, or maybe into someone's hands that seems very noble and sincere at first, eventually what happens is that position of absolute power will absolutely corrupt them, and they will end up abusing their position of power, and the world itself will move very fast into tyranny. So because of this reality of the sin nature, that is those running the government are corrupted by the exact sin nature that others are corrupted by under the influence of a government. God, at the beginning of human history, made a decision, given man's corruptibility, to decentralize power. He dispersed power here in Genesis 11. And God, as we will see, did that by creating from one language, multiple languages. Because there now were multiple languages on the face of the earth, the builders could not cooperate with each other, and everybody went into their own similar linguistic speaking group And individual nations, plural nations, developed in the place of world government. And as you go through the Bible, what you'll discover is now, ever since subsequent to the Tower of Babel, God's order of things in our fallen world is through individual nations in a decentralized sense having political power God does not want political power coalesced into one person's hands and so he decentralized political power this is the origin of the beginning of the nation state which is something that God himself is creating right here in Genesis 11 What is happening here in Genesis 11 is sort of assumed or presupposed in the rest of the Bible. For example, in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8, it says, When the Most High gave the nations, plural, their inheritance, he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries. Now, doesn't boundaries kind of sound like borders? Hello? Hello? 
he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of Israel. God says, I want nations, I want borders, I want boundaries. I don't want political power coalesced into a single person like Nimrod. Because if political power is coalesced into a single person like Nimrod, who has a corrupted nature, it won't be long until he abuses that power because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and the government of the earth will move very fast into tyranny. Paul the Apostle in his speech on Mars Hill in Acts 17 and verse 26 says, and he made from one man, that's Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries, there's that word again that sounds like borders, and the boundaries of their habitation. What does God do here in Acts, excuse me, Genesis 11? He created a check and balance system. As long as the different nations are fighting with each other, it's impossible for one person to get control over the entire planet. That's not a bad thing, God says. That's a good thing. Because the last thing you want is for power to be coalesced into a single person because they have a corrupted nature, whether they graduated from Harvard Law School or not. Human nature is human nature. And if you give a human being too much power, ultimately what that human being will do, other than Jesus Christ himself, is he will abuse his position of power. Now, if you can understand this, you can understand the longevity of the United States of America. A lot of people are very upset over the expression American exceptionalism. They think when you use the expression American exceptionalism, then somehow you are teaching racial superiority or racial supremacy or something of that nature. And let me tell you what American exceptionalism actually means. Exceptional means outside of the norm, outside of the rule, an exception to what is normal. The fact of the matter is we here in the United States of America are living under the exact same system that was handed to us back in the 18th century. That is an abnormality. Most nations of the earth like France, for example, have had multiple revolutions, multiple constitutions during the same time period that we here in the United States are living under the exact same system that we were started under. That doesn't necessarily make America racially superior. What it means is what we are experiencing in the United States is the exception to the rule. Most countries of the world know nothing of this because America is unique. And why is it that America is exceptional in this regard because when our founding fathers put together our system of government whether it's the declaration of independence america's birth certificate and later on our constitution they understood very well what the bible teaches about human nature in fact these are the sources that our founding fathers quoted from most frequently and you'll see that 34% of their citations, according to academic studies, come from the Bible. 34% of the original sources that our founding fathers were citing, according to this study by Donald Lutz, in a book called The Origins of American Constitutionalism, 34% of their original citations came from the Bible and stories like, Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9. The next source that they quoted from, a much smaller source, is Baron Montesquieu and then William Blackstone. And then last on the list, just 3% of the time, is John Locke. 
And when you get into the background of Montesquieu and Blackstone and Locke, what you'll discover is that those men were steeped in the Bible also. This is the beginning of American exceptionalism. This is the beginning of American constitutionalism. This is why the American system works and has stood the test of time, whereas other nations have not stood the test of of time. America was started on the right foundation, having a biblical view of human nature. And this is why America's founding fathers, no doubt looking at historical accounts like the Tower of Babel, says the last thing we need to do in this country is coalesce political power into a king. We need to decentralize power. You see this in the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were written to the citizens of New York explaining to them why they should accept and adopt the American Constitution when it was being formed. And you'll notice what James Madison, the father of our Constitution says in Federalist Paper number 51. What is government but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? See, if you understand human nature, you can understand the wisdom of the American system. If you understand human nature, you'll understand exactly what God is doing here by decentralizing political power away from global government into nations. If you don't understand human nature, you don't understand human depravity, you don't understand that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, then America will make no sense to you. And the Tower of Babel story will make no sense to you either. Madison says, but what is government but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, and they're not, If men were angels, no government would be necessary. See, if Nimrod had some sort of uh, perfect nature, what's the problem in him wielding global power? But the problem is he had a sin nature. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be ministered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed. And in the next place, oblige it to control itself. America's founding fathers, quoting the Bible, says, we've got a big problem here. And the problem is sin. The problem is the sin nature. The people under the government have a sin nature, and the people running the government have a sin nature. So we've got to make government strong enough to control the sinful impulses of the masses. But at the same time, we've got to make government weak enough so it doesn't coalesce into tyranny because the people running the government have the exact same sin nature that those who are being governed have. It doesn't matter how many PhDs they have after their name. The solution, according to the American system, the solution as far as God is concerned back in Genesis 11 is to decentralize power, to disperse political power. Now, political power only comes in three ways. You see those expressed in Isaiah 33 verse 22, which says, for the Lord is our judge, that's judicial power, that's the power to interpret a law. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, that's legislative power, that's the capacity to create law. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, king is executive power or the ability to enforce law. You're either 
exercising political power by interpreting a law, creating a law, or enforcing a law. And the only person our founding fathers observed that can do this correctly is someone untainted by a sin nature. When Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom on earth, he will be judge, he will be lawgiver, and he will be king. The problem is, until that day arises, we've got a lot of political leaders that aren't very Christ-like. Can I get an amen to that? Why are they unchristlike? Because they have a corrupted, imperfect nature. So therefore, America's founding fathers said, let's disperse political power. Let's uh, give legislative power to the legislative branch of government. Let's give judicial power to the judicial branch of government. And let's give executive power to the executive branch of government. Because as long as we have all three, power is not being coalesced into one person or one group. This is the whole logic behind the separation of powers in the United States. This is why America and its system has lasted whereas other systems have failed. And even if you notice this chart here, legislative power, let's not give that to too many people either. Let's divide it, what's called bicameralism, between the Senate and the House of Representatives. And let's create a system where these three branches are always fighting amongst themselves. Because as long as they're fighting amongst themselves, they can't engage in tyranny against the people that they're governing. Do you see the logic here? Now, if you think that human beings are basically good at heart, the system will make no sense to you. But if you understand the biblical doctrine of the sin nature and total depravity, then all of a sudden this system makes perfect sense. It's sort of humorous listening to people today complaining there's nothing getting done in Washington, D.C. And I say to myself, well, thank God for that. <laughs> you know, if you want to live in a country where things get done quick, I would recommend Saudi Arabia. I'd recommend Iran, where elections are just kind of a nuisance anyway. Let's just go ahead and have a fake election. We're starting to see some of that in the United States, aren't we? Because the people are sort of an encumbrance, and we went to Harvard, and we understand how things should be better than you. And what's happening is people are bypassing the separation, separation of powers idea. And yet, that is the very idea that has made America different and exceptional and given her longevity. James Madison in Federalist Paper number 47, it's very interesting what he says, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary into the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, whether hereditary or self-appointed or elective, must be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Looks like our slides went out, but that's okay. I can go ahead and read this. Do you have in your mind a working definition of tyranny to share with your children and your grandchildren? What is tyranny? Tyranny involves taking two of the three branches whether it's legislative and executive into one person's hands, whether it's executive and judicial in one person's hands, whether it's legislative and judicial in one person's hands, and coalescing that power into the hands of a single individual. That becomes the seed of tyranny and despotism. You see, these are all principles and concepts that have largely been forgotten today. 
And they've largely been forgotten because of this idea that man is inherently good at his core. This is what people think. This is what people believe. This is what people are being taught. And so therefore, what's the harm of merging political power, two branches, into the hands of one individual or person? I might as well just lay it out on the line here. When the President of the United States, as the current president did towards the beginning of his term, signs executive order after executive order after executive order, most of which he probably hasn't even read, he is taking legislative power and bringing it into the hands of the executive when the executive branch of government really has no ability according to our founding fathers designed to make law. When he signs executive order after executive order after executive order, that's the very thing that Madison warned about in Federalist Paper number 47. And this is the beginning of the uh, American system. Um, let's see, Dan, you've got uh, all this stuff here and I need it for my notes, so um, can you just go down one? Because I'm forgetting what I'm supposed to say. If you can bring it up one more, that'd be great. Even if these people out here aren't uh, enjoying the show, I sure am. <laughs> okay, that's good. I've got my mental cue. Keep working. And if you want to, if you want to preach a little bit too, let me know. I could use a I could use a water break. Thank you very much. So the truth of the matter is, America's political governance was divided. Now watch this very carefully. It was divided horizontally. America's founding fathers were so afraid of tyranny, they were so afraid of despotism that they divided political power horizontally, but then they did something else. They divided it vertically. So in the United States of America, we don't just have one layer of government. We have two layers of government operating over the same geographic expanse. Those layers of government are the federal government, the national government, in other words, and then the individual state governance. So every day of your life, you should wake up and you should praise the Lord that you live in this kind of system with all of its encumbrances and with all of its hassles because this is the very system that's keeping you free. So if one branch of government, like the federal government, for example, becomes totalitarian, hey, we need critical race theory taught in the schools. Other branches of government at the state level, let's say, for example, Florida or Texas, they can stand up and say, you know, that's not so hot an idea. Let's have a debate and let's have a discussion about this. They're not having this kind of discussion in Saudi Arabia. They're not having this kind of discussion in Iran. But they're having it in the United States because the United States, in its biblical wisdom, decided at its onset to divide political power up. So one branch of government says, you know what, we need mandatory masks and we need mandatory vaccines. Another branch of government at the state level, let's say hypothetically Florida or Texas, <laughs> can turn around and say, you know, that's not such a hot idea. Let's have a debate or let's have a discussion about this. And so this becomes the very thing that God himself put into effect at the Tower of Babel as a matter of political philosophy. So what I am trying to describe here is another institution which God himself created for the purpose of preserving humanity in its fallenness. And all of these we've actually studied here in the book of Genesis. There are certain institutions or certain things that God has done or God has given to humanity for the purpose of controlling our sin nature 
so that culture can be preserved. One of those institutions is the fact that we are all made in God's image. Another institution is the fact that we have marriage and the family. Another institution relates to the fact that we have human conscience. Another institution relates to the institution of labor. Another institution relates to the institution of government. And here we're seeing another institution come into effect. And that institution relates to nationalism. God, based on what I'm saying, is pro-nationalism. He is pro-patriotism. There's a lot of people that will make you feel guilty for being patriotic. But the truth of the matter is God here is establishing patriotism. And he wants patriotism to exist because he is the author of the nation state. So here's a pretty basic question to ask yourselves as we're talking about the origin of the nation state. What do you have to have for a nation? You ever thought about that? I mean, I'm going to set up a nation. What do I need? What is the bare basics or the bare minimum that you need to have a nation? Here's the four things you need. Number one, you need a common currency. Number two, you need a common language. Number three, you need a common culture. And the fourth thing you need is you need enforceable borders. Now, as I tick through that list, would you not concur or would you not agree that every single one of those is under vile attack today here in the United States? The idea of a common currency is being attacked. The idea of a common language is being attacked. The idea of a common culture is being attacked. And of course, here in Texas, we feel it quite a bit with the porous border mentality. Yet the truth of the matter is these are things that God ordained in Genesis 11. This, to, to not enforce the borders of a nation means you really don't have a nation anymore. God is pro-nation because God established nations at the Tower of Babel because he wanted to disrupt political power. So we move away from God's observations, and there's three of them. The universality of the human race, the beginning of sin, and the potential for wickedness. And we move now into God's intervention what does God do to rectify the problem? You see that there in verses 7 and 8. And notice what Genesis chapter 11 and verse 7 says. It says, come, let us. Did you catch that? You should highlight, circle, put a star around us there. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. And then you move into verse 8, and it says, So God scattered them abroad from there over the face of the entire earth. So now we see God intervening, and as God intervenes, he intends to do two things. They're right there in verse 7. Number one, he goes down. Number two, he confounds. And then his intention is going to be followed by disruption that he's going to do in verse 8. First of all, notice God going down. Did you notice that God has to go down to see what humanity is doing? If you go back to verse 4, it talks about a tower whose top is going to reach into heaven. The Tower of Babel was one of the greatest achievements man had ever done in their spirit of self-sufficiency and pride. And yet God actually had to descend, God had to go down, God had to look just to see what sandcastle it was they were building. 
This shows us something about the nature of God. No matter how powerful man becomes, or no matter how powerful he thinks he is, he's no measure for God. God has to just come down. He has to take a look. He's got to get out his microscope. He's got to get out his magnifying glass just to see what the little insects down there are doing. You'll notice that he goes down, and then I drew your attention to the fact that he says, come let us go down. We've seen the let us language many times in the book of Genesis, where it says in Genesis 1 verse 26, let us make man in our own likeness according to our likeness, according to our image. Who's the us? Well, the us is a reference to the plurality of the Godhead. As Christians, we are monotheistic. We worship one God. Yet, God has expressed himself in three personages. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We worship one God, yet God has expressed himself in three separate personages. The Son is God, just like the Holy Spirit is God, just like the Father is God. But it's very interesting that the Spirit is unique in his spiritness. The Father is unique in his fatherhood. The Son is unique in his sonship. And you say, well, pastor, can you explain this more? I really can't. It's a great mystery. It's uh, far beyond my pay grade. Let's just put it that way. But it is a, a reality that the Bible teaches. We call this the mystery of the Trinity. And when God says, let us go down, it's one of your very early references in the Bible to the triunity of God. Now, it is true that you're going to have to get to the New Testament before you get a fleshing out of this and a full-fledged explanation. Jesus is called God in John 8, verse 58. The Father is called God in Ephesians 4, verse 6. The Spirit is called God in Acts 5, verses 3 and 4. And yet, somehow... They are part of a, the singular Godhead, monotheism. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says, The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. See, the Muslims, they make fun of us because they call us the three God Christians. They don't believe that we're monotheistic because of this doctrine of the Trinity and yet we are monotheistic. We worship only one God, and yet that God has expressed himself in three separate personages. That's the beginning of the let us language here. Over in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, earlier in our study a few weeks back, probably by now a few months back, it says, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. You remember when Isaiah was called into the ministry in the book of Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. It says of Isaiah, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Why does it keep saying over and over again, us, us, us? It's an infant or early description of the plurality that exists within the Godhead because of the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, when you go back to Genesis 1, 26, it says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The Jewish rabbis want nothing to do with this doctrine of the Trinity in Hebrew Bible. And they make a statement that this really has nothing to do with the Trinity. This is just God having a discussion with the angels. 
Well, as my professor, Dr. Toussaint, used to say, that dog won't hunt. The reason is because the angels are not made in God's image. So when God says in Genesis 1 verse 26, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness, that is a discussion, that is a conversation that is taking place amongst the separate personages of the Trinity. The Son is unique in his sonness, yet he shares the same essence of deity with the Father. The Spirit is unique in His spiritness, yet He shares the same essence of deity with the Son and the Father. The Father is unique in His fatherness, yet He shares the same essence of deity with the other members of the Trinity, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. You'll spend your whole life as a Christian trying to wrap your mind around this. It's one of those truths that could only have come from above. There is no human being that could have ever come up with such an idea. And it's interesting that God wants government to take place in these kind of conversations. You're in a church right now that believes in the elder-led model. And a lot of the decisions that we make in this church relate to a conversation between the elders. God has patterned it this way. God has designed it this way. In fact, this is how God himself operates when he is making decisions, a, a discussion, a, a conversation. Now, it is true that the son submits to the will of the father. But the son, when he submits to the will of the father, does not relinquish one iota his deity. He retains his deity. It is a submission in function and role only, but not in what we would call ontology or value or worth. My wife submits to my authority as her husband. But when she submits to my authority as her husband, she does not relinquish one iota the fact that she is also an image bearer of God as I am. She is also a joint heir to salvation as I am. Her submission is not in value. It is in function and role. And when we make decisions in our home, it generally is a conversation that takes place first. Foolish is the man that rules in a tyrannical fashion in his home and doesn't consult his wife's perspective or opinion. I mean, the Trinity itself doesn't even do that. And so that's what's bound up here in this expression, let us. Arnold Fruchtenbaum puts it this way in his commentary on the book of Genesis. Once again, the word us, the plural pronoun is used implying plurality in the Godhead. Jonathan Sarfati, in his commentary on the book of Genesis, says, Here we see another example of plurality in the Godhead because Yahweh says, Let us. So God now comes down. His first intention is to come down, his second intention is to confound. You see the confounding that God does in Genesis chapter 11. And notice, if you will, verse 7. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not be able to understand one another's speech. A literal translation from the Hebrew would read as follows, so that they will not hear a man in the language of his friend. Let's not let these builders cooperate with each other, because if they cooperate with each other, they're going to be successful in their project towards one world government, and given the imperfectibility of the sin nature, it will become very tyrannical very, very fast. And so let's disperse power, let's decentralize power amongst the various nations. 
It's kind of interesting that when you get to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, God restores to some extent what was lost here. In fact, there is coming upon the earth a government of Jesus Christ, and that government is going to be executed as one language will once again exist over the face of the earth. We find that in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9, where it says, For then I will restore to the people's pure lips. It's kind of interesting on the day of Pentecost, all of a sudden the apostles could be heard in known dialects that the apostles themselves didn't speak. You find that in Acts 2, verses 5 through 8. And it's kind of interesting that when the millennial kingdom comes upon the earth one day, there once again will be one language on the face of the earth. In other words, what got broken here in Genesis 11 is going to be restored one day. Hints of it in Acts 2, but ultimately it's going to be restored in the millennial kingdom. And this reveals the nature of God. This is what God does. God fixes what got broke. We in our fallen state are in a very broken state. And yet when we trust Christ as Savior and we yield to him by way of discipleship, what you discover is a lot of the things that we messed up as fallen human beings, God will start to put back into shape. He'll restore, I think, a person's finances. To some extent, he can restore a person's health. He can restore a person's marriage. He can restore a broken friendship, a strained relationship, because that is the nature of God. This is why Jesus came into the world, Luke 19 and verse 10, to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus is not interested in helping people that think they've got everything figured out. What he's interested in is helping people that realize that they're lost. And we trust Christ as Savior in our lost state and the Holy Spirit begins to work in our lives and suddenly he is restoring what got broken. He is fixing what was in need of repair. So we see God confounding, and we also see, in addition to God's intention, we see his disruption of things there in verse 8. Notice what it says there. It says, so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth. This explains an awful lot, doesn't it? As you look back at Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Well, that doesn't fit with Genesis 10, does it? If you look back at Genesis 10 and verse 5, it says, Everyone according to his language. Genesis 10 verse 20, According to their families and according to their languages. Genesis 10, verse 31, according to their languages. So how is it that we move from a language, Genesis 11, verse 1, to references to languages, plural, in Genesis 10? The answer is what God did at Babel. By preventing these builders from cooperating with each other so that political power can be dispersed, God created multiple languages. You'll notice the reference here a couple of times, also in verse 9, but also in verse 8. It keeps talking about whole creation. Look at verse 8. So the Lord scattered them from abroad over the face of the whole earth. Verse 9, you'll see the reference to the whole earth. Verse 9, towards the very end, it says the whole earth. What happened here at the Tower of Babel affected the entire world. The best way I could think about it is you take a stone or a rock 
and you throw that stone into a calm, placid pond, and the wake reverberates in all directions outward. That's what happened at the Tower of Babel. There was a decision that the triune God made to confound the language, and it's had a reverberating effect on the nations of the earth ever since. This, by the way, is how Nimrod got pushed north into Assyria. In Genesis 10, we learn about his kingdom in Shinar and later about his kingdom in Assyria, which is further north. How did Nimrod get pushed up north? It had to do with this confusion of the languages that took place here at the Tower of Babel. I like very much what Clarence Larkin says in his commentary on the book of Revelation. He says this concerning the Tower of Babel. He says, the river on which the city of Babylon was built was one of the four branches into which the river that flowed through the Garden of Eden was divided. And Satan doubtless chose the site of Babylon as his headquarters from which to sally forth to tempt Adam and Eve, it was doubtless here that the antediluvian apostasy had its source that ended in the flood. To this center, the forces of evil gravitated after the flood and Babel was the result. This was the origin of the nations. Now listen to this. But the nations were not scattered abroad over the face of the earth until Satan had implanted in them a virus of a doctrine that has been the source of every false religion the world has ever known. See, why can't God use the Assyrians? Because they've been corrupted by the Tower of Babel. Why can't he use the Phoenicians? They've been corrupted by the Tower of Babel. Why can't he use the Egyptians? Why can't he use Greece or Rome or Asia or India to fulfill his purposes? Because every nation owes its origin to the Tower of Babel. Every nation has been corrupted by what happened here. And so what does God have to do in Genesis 12? He's got to start a new nation. That becomes the significance of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is the only nation that has ever existed that existed subsequent to the Tower of Babel, after the Tower of Babel. And God has to create that special nation through which to channel his uh, messianic blessings to the entire earth. You come to the very end here of verses 8 and 9, and you see the lasting results. Let's take a look very fast at verses 8 and 9. At least let's just read the verses. It says, So the Lord scattered them from there over the face of the earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, and because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the entire earth. Essentially, there are three things that happened of a lasting fashion because of what God did. Number one, they abandoned the project, verse 8. Number two, God gave them a name. You see that in verse 9. There's a lot of sarcasm here. They wanted a name for themselves. God says, you're not going to have a name for yourself. I'll give you the name. And then number three, they were scattered. Originally, they came together against God's plan to spread out. And they thought they had one up on God. And God said, no, whether you're going to obey my command through volition or you're going to obey my command through the force of my decrees, the scattering will take place. And so we'll look at those three results next time. And I had so many cool slides to show you on that. Uh, I just can't bear continuing to talk without my slideshow going on. How did the Apostle Paul and others do it without PowerPoint? I don't know. So we'll pick this up next week. 
But, you know, if you're here today for the very first time and you don't know Christ personally, either you're listening online or maybe you're listening after the fact, our exhortation is the same here week after week after week. The Son of Man has come into the world to seek and save that which is lost. All of us are in a broken state because of original sin. And yet Jesus came into the world to restore that broken state. He stepped out of eternity into time to bridge a gap between lost humanity and a holy God that we could not bridge. And he simply asks us to receive as a gift what he's done in our place rather than what we do for ourselves. We don't fix our situation by making ourselves right before God. We fix our situation by allowing God to make us right. The story of the Bible is not man reaching up to God, it's God reaching down to man in the person of Jesus Christ. And we trust in what he has done and we receive that as a free gift. And the moment you receive that as a free gift by way of faith is the moment suddenly you're in a relationship with God that you didn't have before. And so as we work our way through the Bible, our exhortation to people is to trust in what Jesus has done for them. Becoming a a Christian is not a 12-step process. There's a single step where you trust in what Jesus has done in your place. And the moment a person does that is the moment they're made right with God. We call that by way of faith. Another way of saying faith is saying reliance or dependence upon. For my eternity and the safekeeping of my soul, I am trusting or relying upon what Jesus did in my place. And that is the best understanding of the gospel that I know how to give. And you can trust Christ right now, even where you're seated. It's not something you have to walk an aisle to do, join a church to do. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord where the Spirit convicts you of your need to do this. And you trust in Him and Him alone for salvation. If it's something that you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for this ancient story And yet at the same time, um, this story develops for us a political philosophy. It helps us understand how to structure governments. It helps us to understand the truth about human nature. And as we continue on in the Bible, it helps us to understand the lengths that you took to restore what was broken here. I ask, Father, that you would help us uh, understand the full ramifications of what we're studying here in early Genesis. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.